Hi, and welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, our weekly look at the Catholic intellectual tradition and an exploration of the authors, books, and topics that have shaped Catholic thinking for 2,000 years. I'm Dr. Richard Bolzakelli, lecturer in theology at Catholic Studies Academy, in for Jason Gale. And I'm joined this week by Dr. Smith, our lecturer in philosophy at Catholic Studies Academy, and Mr. Joel Grossheim, doctoral student in philosophy at the University of St. Thomas Houston Center for Thomistic Studies, where he works as an adjunct professor. Joe is a former student of ours, a graduate of Aquinas College in Nashville, Tennessee from its golden age, and his current interests include political philosophy with a focus on the common good as it defines the proper limits in the scope of action open to the political community. Today we'll be talking about Dr. Smith's new book published by Catholic Studies Academy, uh, Catholic Studies Academy's own imprint, St. John Books, Understanding Political Ideas, a guidebook for Christians and other patriots. The book is available on Amazon and our own website, catholicstudiesacademy.com. We'll be looking into the two major currents of modern political thought, progressivism and conservatism today. Mm -hmm. So Joe, why don't we start off by you just um, telling us a little bit more about yourself and um, you know, the audience doesn't, doesn't know you. I, I don't think they do. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Bozzichelli. It's good to be with you guys this morning. Um, uh, everything you said is correct. I'm studying at the university of St. Thomas in Houston, the center for Thomistic studies. Uh, and I'm very interested in political philosophy. Uh, I first got interested in political philosophy from Dr. Smith actually, uh, <laughs> at Aquinas, uh, in Nashville. One of my favorite classes was a, uh, a, a a political philosophy class where we we started with Plato's Republic, <laughs> we worked through Aristotle, we worked through the medievals and all the way through to modernism and finally to a bit of Marxism at the end. Uh, and it was very interesting seeing the historical development of those thoughts, right? You get you got a better sense of where all of these ideas are coming from if you're if you're as every 18 year old is new on the scene of politics, right? You don't mm -hmm. really have a good right sense of what everybody's talking about and where all these positions are coming from. They seem largely arbitrary, just something you were assigned from your parents or mm -hmm. whoever, and you just go with it. And sometimes <laughs> you change your mind and sometimes uh, you don't. And uh, it just seems really haphazard unless you get a strong foundational sense for where all of this is coming from and where all of it's trying to go. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's where that originally came from. Um, and uh, yeah, that's um, I think I think that really develops into what this book is working to accomplish, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so you read the book. That, that's Joe. the way I've been. Um, I mean, obviously you read the book, but I mean, you read the book, actually, you were a reader, right, for the book uh, in its in its developmental stage. So right. You, you were pretty into the project, right? Well, I, I mean, like you I, I saw an early about draft the production uh, of this particular book. I thought it was a great idea, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. right? Yeah, I mean, um, I've been selling the book before the book was available for sale uh, <laughs> to as many people as I can um, because it's it's good. I think I think most of us don't have a strong sense of where all these political positions mm -hmm. are coming from, right? And in order to make you know, informed arguments and take informed positions, you've got to be informed on what these people are saying, what their terms mm -hmm. mean, what their goals are. Yeah. What this, what, and what more importantly, and something that Smith brings out in the book, right, is what sort of anthropology underlies all of right. these different positions as well, right? So you're probably actually, you're probably pretty close um, to the demographic toward which the book is aimed. I mean, your, your academic preparation is far more advanced say than the the typical reader might be right but you know these guys or you know you you i mean your age bracket is probably right in line with the the type of people this book is aimed at not just your age bracket but i mean mm -hmm. people you know right people you went to you went to school with um not long ago people you drink beer with or are the kinds of people who should read this book right yeah i think so um and uh I'd say it's definitely, it was definitely really great for me to read. Uh, and I thought especially, and I've made this remark to Dr. Smith when I read the opening drafts, I thought especially the work on Marxism and neo-Marxism was very good. Uh, but I think the special thing that this text is going to offer um, readers is it's, it's going to be for readers who 
don't have a really developed background in politics, who haven't had the time and the opportunity to engage with all these thinkers that the book is covering. Um, it's, a, and it's, it's, a, it's a special challenge in democratic America, and especially today, you're right. expected to be a full-time politician, <laughs> right? You're expected right. to be able to. <clears throat> right. uh, it's yeah. weird. And, and I, I think, so I agree with you, Joe. I think one of the things this book, this book offers is a really digestible way to, to suddenly familiarize yourself with like 10 different political currents that, mm -hmm. that influence uh, everything we're talking about today, everything we're expected to go to the polls, knowing something about. Right. Um, and there's not, to my knowledge, anything else that, that does a good job of that. I mean, sure, we could, there are plenty of books on Marxism, plenty of books on progressivism mm -hmm. that, you know, um, that kind of presuppose a, a significant right. preparation in these, in, in these lines of thought, right, mm -hmm. already, before you even put the book, pick the book up. Mm -hmm. And that's just not, practically speaking, a help for a person who is trying to raise a family or or yeah. or not lose his job or. I appreciate those comments, guys. I, one thing I want to say about it is uh, about the text. That's exactly kind of what I wanted to do. Is I wanted to say some positive things at the beginning and at the end. So positive is in at the beginning. Like here's kind of what I think is kind of a classical model, classical set of principles for political life. Then you kind of move to a taxonomy of errors, right? Uh -huh. It's kind of a catalog of mistakes. Um, and, and then, you know, wrap up with, with, you know, kind of maybe a hopeful, hopeful vision, you know, for the, for the future uh, about where we can go. But one of the things that's interesting is even if you were to go to college, like you try to study some of this in college, just in a practical, like you need to be a citizen of a Republic kind of uh, point of view, you still don't quite get that, sort of plainly stated, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like you might take a political science class, but you're gonna learn a lot of stuff about, you know, racial demographics and voting, right? You're not gonna learn yeah. about eight big ideas in, politi in political thought and how you should kind of engage with them. Well, the, what, one of the things that's actually problematic, right? I think, Ben, it's, is um, in, when people get, they go to college, to, today going to college is a very political enterprise. Sure. And uh, even for people who aren't studying politics, right? That's I mean, right, everybody's right. de facto a politics major or something like that. <laughs> and um, and the thing is, they're thrown they're thrown into these classes in which all sorts of presuppositions are already being made, right? And they they haven't had an opportunity even to be critical of those mm -hmm. presuppositions. Mm -hmm. So right. you know, you've got anytime we're talking about now suddenly, um, you know, something like um, we're talking about multiculturalism, or we're talking about Right. Uh, equity. We, we throw these terms around, but we don't stop to think of the fact. We don't stop to think of the fact that they're they're grounded in they're grounded in certain political constructs mm -hmm. that we haven't had a chance to adjudicate yet. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true, um, and I think it's just kind of a failure. Uh, you know, just a a deficiency in uh, our contemporary curriculum. Um, Again, especially for for America, it's really interesting when you read the founders on some of this stuff of America, and that's something I've done more in recent years than, than in the past. You know how clear they were on the importance of having a well well educated citizens, mm -hmm. uh, citizens who could think uh, about ideas, who appreciated and loved uh, liberty, well rightly conceived. You know that that sort of thing. You know and that they're very clear, and I, I kind of wonder what they would say today, that an ignorant <laughs> um, uh, populace really isn't capable of functioning as a republic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, so anyways, I mean, that's, uh, um, yeah, I think that is something that that uh, this book is trying to remedy and that is a deficiency in um, a lot of our higher education. So let's, now we, we were going to talk today about progressivism and uh and conservatism mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. and it's funny we you know we the term the labels we usually use are liberal and conservative like mm -hmm. that's the more common thing sure i think but in in recent years people have um people have become more familiar with the term progressive right yeah and um and it's it's funny because you know there there was a time when obviously progressivism was a was a major 
current and people mm-hmm. called it progressivism right mm-hmm. um but but there at some point we stopped using that word yeah yeah and we started we started juxtaposing conservative and liberal but those are sort of misnomers aren't they yeah yeah they are i mean one of the things uh I, as you'll notice, I avoid using the word liberal in the in the in this book in the common way, almost universally. I mean, I think I mentioned it in, uh, in its common usage maybe twice or something, but I really try to change that um, you know, just because I think it's 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 uh, misguided and unhelpful the way we use the word liberal today. Uh-huh. Um, liberal really should be uh, for people like Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek and and people who are you know, we consider on the right in the sense that they're uh, for liberty, right? There's their mm-hmm. their people. You know, uh, you know, the libertarian movement is liberal, actually, uh-huh. right? In the sense that what they really espouse is individual liberty. Um, uh, so, uh, liberal, I think, really should be uh, held for classical liberalism that grows out of the thinking of people like John Locke. Um, also, to some extent, Thomas Reed and the Scottish common sense philosophers. Um, and then, you know, in the United States, of course, we can find it espoused, you know, to one, to one degree or another uh, in, in some of the founding documents. Um, certainly, I would think of Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson, as, as, as being a classical liberal. Um, but, you know, I think Thomas Jefferson would... Uh, be highly disturbed by the people who travel under the term liberal today, right? Mm-hmm. He would think that they were were not liberal at all, as in the sense, not people in favor of individual liberty. Um, conservative, right? So I actually really like the fact that the, the left-wing political folks have taken on the label progressive. Um, you know, and I know that that's where they did, you know, do it for themselves for rhetorical reasons, but I actually think it's just more accurate. I think it's a more accurate label for them uh, and, and makes it a little bit clearer, you know, what we're usually kind of going between is progressives and conservatives, right? Uh, one group wanting to progress towards something, another group wanting to conserve something, right? And the dynamic conflicts of our political life uh, play out in that, that struggle, right? Um, yeah. So I think one of the problems, right, is that uh, it, let, it helps us to actually identify one of the points of controversy, which is mm-hmm. not simply whether we should progress or conserve, right, mm-hmm. but instead toward what? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, right. Right. And what, on the other hand, are we trying to conserve? The progressives would characterize conservatives as those who wish to remain entrenched in unjust systems, yeah, sure, mm-hmm. and thus paint us as evil. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. While they wish to progress toward justice, toward equity, mm-hmm. toward whatever it is of the right, uh, without really defining what they mean by those things. Sure, sure. Um, so wh- why don't we can you help us understand like what is that all about? What are the progressives progressing sure. towards? Yeah, so progressivism really as a term grows out of the late 19th century uh political movements. It's interesting. Um um, you know, some of their, their original agenda, you could certainly sympathize with, uh, progressive, the progressive movement was kind of, a, I think a reaction to some of the, uh, abuses and, um, difficulties I'll say that arose from the exercise of classical liberalism in a new industrial age, Right. It's, it, it is important when you're thinking about ideas to remember the facts on the ground, right? Uh-huh. Uh, that is that, you know, you, you, you go, you go, there's a radical shift in the late 19th century. And as philosophers, sometimes I think we don't quite appreciate the importance of, the, of technology and all this. Um, that is actually a strength, uh, something that Marx, I think, brings to the fore that's to his credit, is that, you know, we go from agrarian society relatively quickly, right, after the, after the Civil War, American Civil War, to industrial society and mass urbanization, right? Uh-huh. And it's arguable that classical liberalism kind of struggled a little bit with that transition, right? Uh, I think both in England and in the United States, right? Um, when classical liberalism was originally developed, both England and the United States were primar- primarily agrarian. Uh, and you had lots of small holders and, and things of that, small property owners. Um, and so I think that transition was pretty messy. 
um, and and led to some some problems. And progressives wanted to address that. Now, at the same time as an industry is changing, there's also a change in kind of intellectual culture mm-hmm. with the growth of things like psychology, uh, the popularization of sociology, the popularization of evolutionary theory, and things of that nature. And so you had a whole class of really middle-class folks. Uh, some of them were religiously motivated. The Literally, the phrase, the social gospel, was a phrase promoted by some groups of progressives uh, in the United States. And they saw themselves really, these are the same folks who, who advocated for prohibition, right? Uh, they saw you know, alcohol as an evil. It led to great evils for the working class in the urban areas. And so they were like, we need to eliminate, you know, uh, this. Hard to imagine left-wing people wanting to eliminate, <laughs> right? You know, that their ans- their political ancestors are prohibitionists, but it's true. And actually, if you think about it, there is a kind of, um, I don't know, I-, I would call it naivete or I- uh, moral idealism that you sometimes find among progressives, right? Um, that, that was shared uh, even today, right? That was shared mm-hmm. by their, their philosophical ancestors. But basically, you know, these folks were inspired and I think made <clears throat> utilitarian type arguments that human suffering is bad, that human satisfaction is good, and that what we need to do is advance the aggregate satisfaction of the community through uh, scientifically informed political reforms of industry, markets, education, um, medicine, across the board, right? Uh, mm-hmm. um, imprisonment, like the, 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 the prison systems, all of those sorts of things needed to be uh, radically reformed by what was the best science of the day and then applied with political power, right? And yeah. they were very clear about this and, and their opponents we're, we're also clear that this they saw this as as a <clears throat> a growth in government beyond the constitutional limits set on government in the United States um, that it went beyond the protection of individual rights uh, and as such you know they often oppose it as an unwarranted growth right in government. <clears throat> probably one of the most famous of the progressives, Woodrow Wilson. We think about him primarily in, in his connection with World War I, right? Um, but he was very clear uh, that he was a progressive. He wanted to use the presidency, especially, aggressively, right? And, and he was also thought, you know, was, I mean, he's on the record as saying the United States Constitution is outdated. It's time to move beyond it. Um, and this is the president of the United States saying this, right? Mm-hmm. A little problematic. Who ostensibly uh, took a, an oath to. <laughs> right. yeah. um, so, um, uh, but you know, I mean, it, for what he saw as good things, right? That is, he wanted to, and this is, I think, what progressives always want to do. They want to use government power to reduce or eliminate human suffering and inequality. Um, and and you know, so you know, he was quite willing to say, well, you know, maybe the, there was a the Constitution had its day. Uh, maybe, but but it was time to time to move on. I would say that's the the yeah. background in America of progressivism tied to John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism. Yeah, and I think I think though, apart from the references to the U.S. constitutional situation, mm-hmm. uh, that that I think that um, that historical outline probably characterizes also what went on in the U.K. Right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but there are a couple of things here that I I want to latch on to, and. Um, one is the enormous conference they have in in scientific learning and technology. Right, right, right. Uh, and which you know, I mean, it's not a terrible thing, right? I mean, to have lots of confidence in mm-hmm. science and technology. I mean, it's mm-hmm. look around us, right? It's it's sure. done a lot of good. Um, another thing is that there are valid critiques that I think from from a Catholic tradition, right? We would, we would say um, they're not all wrong, right? Mm-hmm. So, for example, a kind of laissez-faire capitalism, which I would argue doesn't exist in the United States today and has not existed for a very long time, uh, but a, a laissez-faire capitalism uh, that is built on a socially atomistic understanding of the person, right. sure, sure, does in fact lead to mm-hmm. tremendous injustices. 
sure. uh, the exploitation of people, right? And so what, what would be wrong, one would say, with, with looking at these children working in these factories, losing appendages in these giant mm. machines, right. uh, or people working 16-hour um, days, mm. sleeping and going back to work, just to make ends meet, just to pay mm. the bills, if, to, to keep them in this, in this, um, you know, this, this, uh, this building, this house that is too small for their, for uh, their family sure, and they're dying sure. of tuberculosis. Who could complain, right, that we want to improve the conditions here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. that, so that's, a, that's an actually, that's an area where I think this might explain why it is that so many Catholics gravitate toward uh -huh. aggressive thought historically mm. right but i also want to point out that there's a paradox and i mm. we can address some of these other things but i want to come back to this paradox thing hopefully we'll remember the paradox is that as you described it right that there's a on this utilitarian basis mm -hmm. there is this idea to maximize the aggregate satisfaction right right yeah in other words to to maximize individual goods mm -hmm. Uh, and 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 that this kind of replaces the concept of the common good, right? Um, and what what strikes me is the way you describe it in the book is that it this satisfaction satisfaction is kind of a subjective mm -hmm. feeling state, right? Mm -hmm. And so be, we started out with this tremendous confidence in science and technology, uh, right, right? right? The intellectual, the mm -hmm. rational part of human beings right and eventually it just devolves into sentiment right yeah. rationality reduces sure. to sentiment and sure and i think that largely characterizes where we are today where there's this bizarre conflation and moralization mm. of the idea that science and sentiment are now suddenly the same thing mm. uh but but let's so there and there's more that i could talk about but i don't want to sure. i don't i'm sure. not going to hog the whole discussion so what do you think uh ben and and joe we haven't heard much from joe well i think uh everything you said is is uh good and insightful and correct um i i would like to hear uh some from dr smith on uh what so i, I would say you're advocating for the book uh it, you're doing two things in the book right you're trying to give the historical sort of framework for all of these different conversations that are being had. And you're trying to advocate for uh, what I think we could call a common good traditionalism. Would you mm -hmm. object to that term? No, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. so um, this goes to Bulls and Kelly's uh, last point and it's, uh, what would you say or how would you explain that the common good that we're advocating for really mm -hmm. resolves this paradox in uh, progressive individualism, right? Because mm -hmm. progressive individualism seems like it's trying to produce mm -hmm. a good, yeah, sure. which is good for many, uh -huh. right? And the way we defined the common good was uh, yeah. good, which is one shared by many, right? right? Uh, and that's yeah. precisely the ambiguous point that I think people have trouble yeah. navigating. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question, Joe. Um, and um, Rich, I want to come back to your points about sentiment and science here in a second. But uh, with with the common good, I, I think um, this is a real problem. This is why I, I kind of cringe almost whenever I hear somebody refer to the common good in public, because I think I know they're going to get it wrong. <laughs> right? And I know that sounds awfully you know, kind of snobby, but it's just true, uh, unfortunately. Um, so let, let's think about it this way. <clears throat> if you were to compare a libertarian to a progressive. Okay, I think that's a, a nice, nice kind of apples to apples comparison. Both the libertarian and the um, uh, progressive are advocating for the individual good, right? Mm -hmm. um, what uh, the libertarian wants to say is, I have a right to pursue my individual good, period, and you must not interfere with it. Uh, what the progressive is gonna say is, well, actually, we're going to amplify the individual good as much as possible. And in order to do that, we may occasionally curb your pursuit of your individual good, <laughs> right? Um, but what's at stake there are they're both, they're both arguing, they're both pursuing the individual good, right? 
Um, one is is pursuing it in terms of a large basket of you know men, of the individual good of men of of many people. The other is pursuing just his own individual good. Um, but both uh, are dedicated to the individual good rather than the common good. The common good is above both, and I think it it you know if if what we're doing here is we're like I should be able to pursue my individual good we should pursue the most for the most number, right? And that's the conflict, right? Where we're, mm-hmm. we're against each other. That's defining the conflict only in terms of the individual good, which is actually an inferior good to the true common good, right? The true common good, right? Uh, is uh, any common good is a good one in number shared by many. Um, and in, the, in, the, in politics, right? It's civic happiness, right? Or uh, which comes down to basically, the just development, use, and exchange of basic goods and services. Um, the um, so that's a higher good. See, that's what I want to do is I want to break this in, this impasse between the two by saying, look, actually, it's still your good, right? But it's your common good you share with others. I think we can. I think I can illustrate that well by just thinking about the dynamics of a family, right? Um, when you think about the family, husbands and wives can end up in conflict with one another when they start thinking about their relationship in terms of the individual good, right? Mm -hmm. My career, my satisfaction, my friends, you know, that sort of thing, right? Um, And they start to pull apart, right? Because the individual good is not a shared good, right? Yeah, Um, right. You uh, start going in different directions. Yeah, you start going in different directions, literally, right? And the, uh, the common good though, right, of the family is domestic felicity which involves, right, the, the uh, union mutual support of the spouses and the, you know, uh, the procreation education of children, uh, put, stated maybe a little less technically or, 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 or narrowly, you could say domestic felicity in the sense of our shared domestic life is actually, right, more important than the individual good of your career success, right? Your career success might feed into Right, as a as a husband, right, like your success in your career, and your your job, your professional life should support that common good. So it has mm-hmm. value, right? But it's a subordinate value to domestic felicity um, uh, as a whole. It's still your good. I just say this to wrap up. Uh, so you know, it's it's not an alien good. It's not the good of something other than yourself, right? But it's a good you do share uh, with others in the family. So. That's what I want to say is progressives are wrong, right? In the sense that they're actually not pursuing the the common good, right? They're just competing with libertarians over who who and how much in the scope of the pursuit of the individual good, right? And that's of course going to cause division and strife. Does that? What do you think, Joe? As far as an answer goes. Well, I- uh, that's a. I mean, that's great. Um, I, you said something about uh, libertarians and progressives earlier that I wanted to just follow up on, if we have a moment. Uh, so, one thing you said in the book uh, when you were discussing utilitarianism and mm-hmm. the principles operative there was that uh, the utilitarian, at least, they would say they have no logical basis for privileging their pleasure over others. You said. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was reading that. I was thinking. Uh, I, it doesn't seem to me that there's much of a logical basis, or maybe, there, maybe there's a logical basis, but I'm not sure that there's much reason uh, <laughs> that uh, they would privilege the good of the whole over themselves, mm-hmm. In, mm-hmm. unless, right, unless they just found more personal satisfaction when they saw it sure. in other people. Yeah. And I think this is what the libertarian and the utilitarian would say, is that, mm. um, look, the, the way it happens, incidentally, by a happy... Mm-hmm. coincidence is right. that well, people people seem to do pretty well when we uh, the libertarian might say have mm-hmm. as little government action as possible we sure drive forward individual rights and freedoms mm-hmm. and the uh utilitarian might say look i i see the concern the concern that we might subordinate certain people to the pleasure of others or something but look mm-hmm. the way it's happened it doesn't really look you know we haven't we haven't enslaved anybody in a long time sure right so we're probably not going to oppress new people we're probably still going to keep securing goods for many people so what's mm-hmm. what's really the problem if it just happens to be working out consistently mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so from a pragmatic perspective, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting, actually, that, um, you know, if you look at, say, the, the work of the Acton Institute, um, where they, you know, they're, they're, they're running conferences um, toward a free and virtuous society, right? Mm. And uh, they, they, they do a pretty good job. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's run, it's run, um, it's run by uh, a Catholic uh, priest, right? Mm -hmm. who is very sort of libertarian in his political outlook. And you might ask, well, is that totally kosher? <laughs> well, I guess these days it's, you know, as kosher as anything else you might find. But, <laughs> but, but here's the thing, right, is toward a free and virtuous society. I want to give them credit because they're not envisioning this idea of um, libertarianism that doesn't have some sort of contextualization in a moral framework. Mm -hmm. They're not actually socially atomistic in their philosophy, uh, which I think, and I, I so often, you know, they, they're, you know, they may be sort of, I think, um, unfairly judged, right? Mm -hmm. But what they're talking about, and maybe, maybe this is um, common today, I don't know, at least for many, contemporary libertarians, I would probably put Rand Paul in this category, um, that, that there is a moral framework, right, from which they operate, and that it's really a pragmatic judgment that they're making, like you, just, like you described, that if we, if we cultivate virtue, so we do have, in fact, this idea of a natural moral law, Mm -hmm. We do have this idea of uh, absolute moral boundaries, right? Pl lines we can't cross mm -hmm. with each other and, and obligations that we share toward our fellow human beings. We cultivate the spirit in us, but we, we constrain government in such right. a way that it allows the maximum scope of human uh, self-determined action. Mm -hmm. uh, then the result is, pragmatically speaking, likely to be that we actually do achieve all these great goods, mm -hmm. um, that we that people will orient themselves toward the pursuit of the common good if mm -hmm. left to their own devices, given a proper moral foundation. What, what do you think about that? I think that's um, interesting. I think it's a, a fair assessment of some libertarians, uh, not I think libertarianism as a whole, um, uh, and I, and but as a, a sort of working approach to political life, uh, I think that that's probably fine. And in some ways, <clears throat> probably something like the founders of America envisioned mm -hmm. uh, uh, in terms of one of the things that I, I was just wrong about for, I don't know, 10 years or more uh, with respect to, say, a philosopher like John Locke, who I'd studied a lot. I just hadn't read everything. And I've read a lot more in the last several years. A lot of his letters, for example, which is really cool because you get kind of his informal ways, of, you know, like like what he really believes when he's writing to his friends, right? Uh -huh. and, you know, he he talks about uh, happiness a lot um, as the goal of human life. You'll find him in, in places talking about that in terms of pleasure and pain. And you're like, oh, okay, well, he's just utilitarian, I see. But then you'll also see him say, sometimes say, well, there's true pleasure and there's false pleasure. Right. You know, and you're like, oh, OK. And then you'll sometimes say true happiness and false happiness. Right. I'm like, OK, mm -hmm. what's the distinction. And in a couple of letters, he says uh, that true happiness is um, the perfection of a rational nature. Um, and you're like, oh, well, that kind of sounds Aristotelian. Right. <laughs> you know, I wish he kind of said that more often. Right. Now, maybe that was just kind of like everybody kind of a lot of people sort of assume that. Right. But that's just and I, I came across that line. I was blown away. I was like, I've kind of misinterpreted this guy for a long time because I didn't know that he had this kind of teleology in the background. So then he's kind of think, okay, well, what's he really up to then? He's of the view, and this is different than Aristotle, okay? He, John Locke's of the view, kind of like what you're talking about, that there is a, that, that there are moral ends. That's very important, right? Um, but he's also the, 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 like there are set natural moral goods, right? Um, but he's of the view that those are best pursued with as little government as possible, right? That is mm -hmm. the government basically protecting what he construes as individual rights. 
right? Uh, natural individual rights. That's important mm-hmm. too in Locke. These are not socially granted. <laughs> These are socially recognized, but they exist prior uh, to legislation. <clears throat> to their natural rights. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now that said, I think he is disagreeing with Aristotle. Right? I think Aristotle had a, a a broader, higher view of the role of the polis and political authority um, within <clears throat> the development of the perfection of the rational nature, right? Um, but it's still Aristotelian in the sense of, uh, you know, he recognizing that that is, right? The, that there is a genuine form of happiness. There's false forms of happiness and it's rooted in this kind of perfectionist account. So I think that's possible. <clears throat> uh, I think where, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I wouldn't want to justify it on utilitarian grounds though. <laughs> that's my, uh, I, I think as a rough and ready way of uh, like, kind of like if you were persuading someone uh, to not cheat on their wife or to, to end an affair, you might kind of lead with, Hey man, this is going to lead to a lot of suffering in the long run. You uh-huh. know, you might start there, right? Because, Hey, you know, that's, that's not a bad place to start. Right. You know uh, but you know, your ultimate reasons are deontological, right? That your ultimate reasons are, this is unjust, right. For you uh-huh. to cheat on your wife. Right. Uh, or teleological, and you say, uh, you know, this is diminishing your virtue and happiness. You might not start with that, though, because, you know, if somebody's in an affair that might, you know, my moral excellence might not be the first thing that, you know, you appeal to. Um, but you know, the problem with utilitarianism, right, is that it's just false, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was going to say, it's false and, and, and ultimately irrational because it doesn't give you, I think, a, a good principle for distinguishing between pleasures. You know, Mill at the end of the day will say, well, um, there are some higher pleasures and lower pleasures, right? Um, but pleasure, you know, but really it's kind of like, well, if you're a good English gentleman, you'll agree with me, right? Uh, about what those you're are. well bred. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. Mm-hmm. And again, there's a certain truth to that probably, but it doesn't give you a reason. It doesn't give you a, a rationale for, um, you know, if I can have the pleasures of family and a mistress on the side, why not? Right. Um, it doesn't give you a good rationale. And maybe I'm clever. I'm not going to get caught. Um, you know, uh, so that's what I see as a problem. And then politically, so I think it's false just as a, as a groundwork for ethics. But then politically, the problem is it almost gives you an endless grounds for the expansion of uh, government uh, and law. Right. Like. Anytime you say, hey, this could improve things, right? Then you can say on a, on a utilitarian basis, therefore, let's do another political program. Let's do another, uh, you know, uh, law or whatever. And, you know, I'm not against programs or laws in principle, but, uh, but at the same time, I think from the perspective of the common good, once those programs and laws begin to encroach upon uh, the proper operation of the parts, right? Mm-hmm. Then you've got a real problem and it's a problem about justice, right? Um, so uh, I, I hope that gives you some answer to, yeah, I can see how you could kind of have small government and a good robust view of happiness. I could see that, but I don't think you could do it on a utilitarian basis. I think right. there are two, I think utilitarian is false and it's problematic um, for the reason I stated uh, in, in political terms. Joe, does that answer your question? And Rich, well, I want to I want to pull you back to just one claim. This this claim that there's no logical basis for privileging my pleasure over others. Okay. Uh, so I wonder what is what what's the basis for privileging others' pleasure over mine? Why would I ever do that? Uh, yeah. So I think for Mill, it's not to the exclusion of yours. It's just he wants to say egoism is false, right? Um, and, 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 and oddly enough, this is the weird thing because utilitarianism is a version of consequentialism, but oddly enough, at the end of the day, in, the, in, in his work, utilitarianism, he says pleasure is good in itself. It's the only good in itself, right? So he does recognize there's one good in itself, right? Pleasure, right? Um, and uh, because it's good in itself, it's not good because it's yours. It, it may include yours, right? So it's not an altruistic theory, strictly speaking. It's not like, oh, I have to, you know, leave my pleasure out of it altogether. But I just need, because pleasure is good in itself, I should just be aiming towards the maximization of pleasure in general. Well, yeah, but the always, pleasure is always subjective, isn't it? Like, pleasure is always someone's pleasure. 
So so why not why not mine? I think this is the this is the weakness, right? And mm. then um, it may be yours, but uh, so maybe like this is this is probably true. Is at the end of the day, Mill wants to kind of sneak in a little bit of rationality <laughs> and virtue here, right? Uh-huh. Uh, and this often happens with these kinds of theories, right? Because but it becomes the, totally ad hoc, right? I mean, it has no foundation. Yeah, that's right. I think I think at the end of the day, he would say it's kind of like like say we were dividing up a pizza, right? And you know the way to create the most satisfaction for all of us, right? Well, the way to create the most satisfaction is for eat for all three of us to be very satisfied, right? With the calculus, right? With the outcomes, right? Um, and so we're gonna divide it up probably roughly equally, right? Or something like that, right? Um, what if it's a pathetically small pizza though? What do we do then? <laughs> well, I guess we'll all try, we'll try to still maximize the aggregate, right? Uh, even if it's, you know, pretty low. Um, but I think you might say, well, why why should i be consistent because right like because really what he's making here i think is a claim like look you you pursue pleasure you pursue satisfaction um you need to pursue satisfaction and, and since satisfaction is is a good in itself it should be pursued consistently across the board regardless of whether it's your good or somebody else's good right your pleasure or someone else's and i think that that's probably it's odd in itself, but it's also probably like underneath he's think, thinking you need to be consistent, which is of course really an appeal to rationality, right? I think what what your position and Thomas's position on the, the traditional common good, uh, what it does here is it resolves the good, right? The common good with my good, right? Mm-hmm. I know that my good is is found in the common good. Right. Whereas there is a divide that Listen. might overlap by a happy coincidence in utilitarianism, uh, and it might not. When right. I'm asking, do I maximize this aggregate good or my own pleasure? I need to be able to say it is good for me to maximize the aggregate pleasure. That's right. the reason I do anything It's because uh, it is good for me uh, to do this. That's what's got uh, to be operative when we're undergoing, mm-hmm. when we're performing some action. Right, and sure, so the utilitarian sure. needs to be able to say it's good for me to maximize the aggregate pleasure. But but this is the problem. It seems to me is that there's no necessary connection, no, no necessary connection right, right, right. between my pleasure and the aggregate pleasure. It could very well happen. And you gave a great example of like having a mistress and just trying to get away with it without getting caught. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can. There's all sorts of ways that I can advance my individual pleasure perhaps at the expense of justice and the common good sure right mm-hmm. yeah absolutely and i think that uh, if all you have is the individual good uh to, to to work with you inevitably end up i think in this altruistic egoistic tension yeah. and 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 you know there's a great uh letter in uh the screw tape letters where c.s lewis has the devils talking about this and the elder devils is, is making this point that there are no shared goods right there's only my good and your good and there is no shared good right my good always comes first that's right and if that's it then it's a competition right mm-hmm. at the end of the day right and um and, and unless for some reason you try to create some kind of altruism, right? Which I'm gonna I'm gonna be acting for your good rather than my own. But then, like, mm-hmm. why? That's fine with me. Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, if like if I was like a real egoist, I would want to teach everybody else to be an altruist. Right. <laughs> right. right. Yes. So, that would be like the worst uh, evil uh, conniving, uh, you know, sort of <laughs> free rider problem, right? Where you teach everybody else to be honest and you're a liar. Teach everybody else to be an altruist and you're an egoist, right? And then you're in the best circumstances possible. Right. Well, actually, isn't it interesting, though, in the contemporary political climate, right? This is exactly the kind of thing that, that, that people are getting in trouble for, right? You have these, you have these governors or somebody, you know, out dining uh, at some posh restaurant while they're telling everybody else to stay at home. Stay at home, yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, what the common good brings to the fore, right, is our good, right? And that, that the good that we share together, um, those are the best goods. Right. I mean, like happy family life is the be- is is better than the individual good 
of <clears throat> um, maybe the fun I get out of watching football and drinking a beer, right? Like, there's nothing wrong with that. And as long as that's consistent with the, the, the overall domestic felicity, that's fine. But the domestic felicity is more important, right? Uh, and, and, and better for me even, right? Mm -hmm. When I'm sharing that, say, with the rest of my, um, rest of my family. So there, I want to, um, I want to ask here about a certain inconsistency that I see in contemporary progressivism okay. along these utilitarian lines, right? And that is the focus on the focus that they have on sort of these fringe groups. Okay. Um, so for example, mm -hmm. the LGBTQ mm -hmm. obsession, right? Mm -hmm. Um, transgenderism, mm -hmm. et cetera, where we're trying to find these, we're trying to find these, um, these intersectional identities, right? And mm -hmm. you're going down all the way to the individual level. Mm -hmm. And we're saying that all of society now needs to orient itself toward the satisfaction of these people, mm -hmm. right? And, and the reality is from a utilitarian point of view, they would be the ones that you would be most likely to ignore. You could you could take that approach, uh, yeah. All right, a group of people who constitutes, um, you know, like a, in the case of transgenders, let's say, such small. a small percentage of the actual population mm -hmm. that I can't even give you a number. It's not, it's not yeah. one percent. It's mm -hmm. a hundredth, mm -hmm. a thousandth of a percent, or something, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think if I was a progressive utilitarian, I'd argue back this way: it does not deprive you or any of these other folks who are not trans of individual goods to support the individual goods of trans. In fact, I think, it just, but that's it exactly just makes the, the, it just makes the pie bigger. But right? that's the contested mm. issue, isn't it? Mm. I mean, I think people would argue that in fact, it does infringe upon, upon the good of, uh, you know, uh, upon other people's individual goods to do that. Yeah, um, I, agree and i'm in print you know in uh on on, on opposing um gay marriage on those grounds right mm -hmm. uh that it does it is actually a public matter and therefore it does actually uh incorporate um intrusions upon the self-governance of others um but the um i think um if you're just going with the with satisfaction right it doesn't seem that um, adding, you know, uh, transsexual satisfaction to the total aggregate is should uh, or does decrease the aggregate of most people. Uh -huh. the, uh, yeah. the satisfaction of most people, right? I mean, you might say, like, I mean, the average person in America might say, "Well, I, that's not my thing," but whatever. It doesn't it doesn't diminish my satisfaction. As long as I don't have to make their wedding cakes or something, maybe, right? Yeah, maybe yeah, they concede right. you that or something. Mm -hmm. Um, so I do, but well, I do see what you're saying. I mean, there is this kind of thing, but I think if you're just thinking about it as we're going to grow the 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 total of satisfaction as much as possible, um, then we need to we probably need to eliminate things that would put it or marginalize things or diminish things that would keep us from growing that pie of satisfaction. Um, uh, overall, I think, um, uh, but I, I do think, you know, to, to kind of follow back to a question you asked a little while ago about science and sentimentalism, mm -hmm. right? This is where, uh, you know, I named, I think I named the chapter, the reign of numbers and feelings, right? <laughs> Which was meant to be a little, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. pushy, uh, aggressive, critical, because mm -hmm. it really does come down to the role of feelings. But there's also this sort of veneer of science that works into it. Um, but it's, it's science as instrumental. And I think that's the key point here, right? That for progressives, it's not science just for the sake of rational perfection or science as a, um, it's something we contemplate or we just want to understand astronomy for its own sake, right? But this really goes back, right, to, to, to right, the, the beginnings of, of science when you think about Francis Bacon and people like that, where really, you know, like you think about, Science as power, right? Science as as the as an instrumental means to bring about goods that we want. So I think the progressive advocacy for science is based on 
the observation of its power, its uh, its utility, right? Which is true, right? Um, but ultimately for the sake of advancing satisfaction, right? Um, advancing, you know, the, uh, or, or decreasing pain. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, does that make sense? Yeah. But even, even at the expense of individual, individual goods or something, I mean, like, think about mm-hmm. it, the, the strong connection actually, right. That you have between progressivism and eugenics. Now they would say, right, we're eliminating human suffering by actually in many instances eliminating human beings who suffer. Mm-hmm. Um, does that make? Mm-hmm. I mean, what kind of sense does that make? I mean, I, I kind of get it, it. It works. It works. I mean, it, this is a, I think one of the most common arguments for abortion yeah. is that when uh, progressive arguments for abortion is that unwanted children, right, uh, are going to live miserable lives, and that hurts the feelings of progressives and will hurt the feelings of the miserable person. Uh, I really do think it kind of comes down to like, oh, this feeling of, oh, like this feeling of pity that happens mm-hmm. in, in, in people towards the prospect of a child having to grow up poor and unwanted. And, and, and in order to alleviate both the misery of the poor child and the misery I'm experiencing of pity, let's just go ahead and kill it. Um, and, and that's fine. Right. Because at that point, the fetus can't feel very much. Right. It feels some, but not a lot, not as much as the my feeling of pity or the, the misery it's going to suffer, um, you know, as being poor and unwanted. Now, obviously, that is all uh, I consider just outrageously bad moral reasoning. Right? Mm-hmm. And I think really just I, I cannot understand how anyone thinks that way. Except for original sin, but anyways. Yeah, well, what's interesting? Yeah, yeah. What's interesting about it is that th- this is this is actually, I think, really um, this is interesting because one could say, well, if we push against that logic, right, then might we apply it to transgender individuals? I'm not advocating that, but in fact, I, I'm, I would strongly oppose that. Of course, you would. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, but uh, mm-hmm. if you follow the logic. Mm-hmm. Because you would say something like this. You would say, well, it, we have actually some studies on uh, on the general satisfaction of people who experience right, transgender right, right, right. Uh, identities, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and They're we find gonna... that both in societies in which mm-hmm. it's not accepted and in societies in which it has been accepted for generations, the, mm-hmm. the outcomes in terms of mental health uh, are both dismal. Mm-hmm. And so um, this seems to be, one might argue, a form of unalleviable suffering. Mm -hmm. Uh, Should it not be the case that we just, um, that we eliminate? Yeah, I think, yeah. uh, uh, So just to be clear, you're not advocating that. No, in fact, I would say that, I would say that because I'm I'm deontological and natural law. Right, right, right. uh, I would... Oppose adamantly it. sure oppose, sure. i would protest in the street sure right okay. but uh just yeah so i think um two responses would come from a progressive one is that's primarily because of prejudice that once we get eliminate the prejudice uh there there really won't be this problem um it used to be the case that uh interracial couples uh, suffered this kind of angst and anxiety, right? But as we become more racially mature and equitable, um, you know, that, that's that gone away. And so if we just kind of pursue the same path here, that suffering you're talking about will just go away. How many generations do we have to do that before we realize that outcome? I don't know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, some, it will some, happen. <laughs> in some societies, it... it They've been down that road for for forty years already. Yeah, uh-huh. I think the other thing, though, Rich, uh, is, and I think you're pointing out a weakness in this calculus, um, is though that uh, I just think it's you know progressives, um, uh, along with being utilitarians, kind of qualify it in a humanitarian way, uh, and so again, that I mean that's just an inconsi- a flat inconsistency. But, but they right? are openly advocating today for for assisted suicide on the grounds of depression. Assisted suicide, yeah, sure. Um, 
the so it's uh, not imposed by some other person, right? But, right, right. But right. they, um, but but I mean, think about it, right? That that actually is the solution they've gone to, eliminating sure. this particular person. It, well, yeah, I mean, you like if you, um, yeah, not imposed, right? Uh, not imposed. They wouldn't say that assisted suicide is the first thing either that they would uh, that they would want for somebody who's no, but they've lowered right? the threshold even for sure. for when they're willing to administer it. Well, the point is they. If you have some ready at hand solution, allegedly to alleviate suffering, namely hormonal therapy and uh, sexual transition, you should try that out first and see if that doesn't alleviate your suffering. <laughs> right. right. And uh, you can't you can't stand in the way of that. Right. We can't jump straight to the the last solution, which is to kill ourselves. Right. We got to maybe try some other things out that maybe have mm -hmm. it seemed to work for some people. Mm -hmm. It seems yeah. to be what they would, what they would say. I think, yeah, and I, I think you're right, Joe. And I think, as I said, I, I think there's a kind of a humanitarian streak in the sense that uh, what I mean by that is um, egalitarian, right? Actually, that is the other great evil is inequality, right? Um, and this is something that's interesting about utilitarianism that I would try to point out. Uh, it takes a while. I don't know, Joe, if you've had the experience of teaching any about utilitarianism yet in class, but one of the things is when you hear the greatest good for the greatest number, Every student I've ever taught automatically thinks that means equal. Um, and huh. uh, that's what they hear. They hear, I literally will say, greatest good for the greatest number, <laughs> and they hear equal. I don't know why. <laughs> I think we're so programmed, right, uh, in that direction. Um, and then I have to kind of disabuse them of that. And I make up kind of wild scenarios where you could have 25% of the pop, you know, or 60% of the pop, uh, population enslaved 40%. Mm -hmm. And that 60% so happy that the misery of the 40% outweighs yeah, 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 you know, yeah. that kind of thing, right? Um, because yeah, whatever. So um the um, um but I think that there's a strong qualifier in contemporary progressivism that that maximum aggregate really does kind of mean and as equal as possible. Um like John Rawls, uh, who if you American uh, folks might not be as familiar with him. he's an English fella, but he's really kind of the the big theorist from say the 70s and 80s and 90s for kind of um, what sometimes goes by welfare liberalism or, or democratic socialism. Um, and you know, what he says is we'll allow inequalities that raise all ships, right? All boats, but uh, including the lowest, but we won't we'll allow any inequalities that don't. Right. So uh, if your inequality is just, you know, your enjoyment of inequality is just, you know, I enjoy, uh, you know, I don't know, playing polo or something <laughs> you know, like you're really just fabulously rich, but it doesn't benefit the whole, then we're not going to allow that. Um, but if it does kind of raise the ships right of the lowest, then we will. So I think he talks about a kind of utilitarianism that's qualified by a commitment to equality. Um, so I think that's kind of rich where progressivism moves right um yeah i exactly. think it sort of throws in that qualifier again as equal as possible yeah uh, except though I, I go back to the euthanasia thing right mm -hmm. so-called mm -hmm. because it, actually we see now in some of these very progressive places mm -hmm. that people are advocating for and indeed practicing um physician imposed death even without the consent of the person right yeah I mean, and i think that that's kind of a logical outcome in the long term yeah and i i think so i i just want to point it out because i i think that this is it is the logical outcome it seems to me that this is um this is think, where these roads yeah. lead and I, th I think once you've eliminated all unnecessary suffering right uh -huh. i think maybe this, if i was a progressive right so right now I might say there's a lot of suffering that's unnecessary and a lot of inequality that's unnecessary. Um, once I've eliminated all of that, that might be the best option in some cases, but usually it's going to be, you know, kind of at the end of life cases or incurable depression or something like uh, that, you know? Uh, but again, you know, um, for the for the many, it's not going to happen. And I think the appeal here, and this is so, this is why I, 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 I say progressivism is just a disaster 
is because in the book in the chapter on, on progressivism, uh, because this really is a, a mere sentimentalism. And I really do think a lot of it, and this is so weird. A lot of it does come down to some pity, um, which mm-hmm. I know seems weird, right? Like, mm-hmm. shouldn't we pity people? And I would say, yeah, sure. But somehow like our, our experience of pity motivates us to want to do very strange things, right? <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I don't know why, but it, it just does. And so pity um, trumps, right? Logic, it trumps natural law principles, deontology, virtue, uh, natural te- teleology, all those sorts of things. But there are people, though, who in this grand calculus um, are not entitled to pity, right? <laughs> and so they become they become the new marginalized. And uh, you know, as as um, Giorgio Agamben puts it, right? They're la vita nuda. They're they're just um, bare life. They're they're merely alive, and they're mm-hmm. not really persons. Mm-hmm. And you can you can eliminate them. And this is where I think, you know, the contemporary landscape you see people talking about conservatives uh, from the progressive side in these kinds of categories. It seems to me, mm. we haven't talked much about conservatism. So I- Yeah, sure, I sure. Um, Joe, did you wanna say something real quick? Uh, well, I just, a, a thought on, on pity. Uh, it was interesting to me when you were talking about it the first time and it reoccurred to me just now that, you know, pity uh, really should move us to help other people. Uh, What's interesting was when you were talking about it uh, for the progressive pity, it seems is uh, something to get to, what we we want to do when we feel pity is get rid of our pity and not Mm -hmm. to deal with the object of our pity (laughs) in the world, right? right. right? Whatever happens to that object doesn't matter as long Uh as my feeling of pity goes away. That's right. I just thought that was (laughs) really extraordinary. Yeah, right. I that's think the way a, that's the way it works. And I think it's a kind of, I mean, frankly, it's a kind of softness, right? Um, that's weird. It's it, it, like I can't have negative emotional experiences, right? It's actually, when you think, about <laughs> you know? and that's really that's yeah. a, that's really that's awful. <laughs> you know? I mean, you that's think the, about the human life and yeah, history, and you go back to Aristotle and the Greeks, right? The the poetics. Aristotle mm-hmm. talks about tragedy as the highest form of drama because it invokes the feelings of pity and fear. <laughs> no, no, it's cathartic for us to <laughs> sure. good things, right? Uh, uh, yeah, it's funny because you know the Catholic teaching on um, you know the response of the Catholic Church to things like euthanasia and abortion mm-hmm. along those very lines. Mm-hmm. It is precisely to point out this um, this fact that what it seeks to do is insulate mm-hmm. the subject mm-hmm. from the suffering mm-hmm. that he's. I, I I I can't bear the I can't bear the feeling, so I'll eliminate the object. Right. <laughs> All right, the guys, problem isn't uh, really grandma's suffering; it's my suffering. <laughs> it's my, suffering. <laughs> my suffering over grandma's suffering is just right. Too- Join us on our next episode as we cover conservatism. Until then, check out all of our content over at catholicstudiesacademy.com. Until next time, God bless.